I'm very happy to be introducing Pamela Paul this evening to discuss her memoir, My Life with Bob, with the great subtitle, Flawed Heroine Keeps Book of Books, Plot Ensues. This is Paul's fifth book, and she was here at Politics and Prose just a couple of years ago to discuss By the Book, which is a collection of writers on literature and the literary life. It's a weekly feature that she launched in the New York Times Book Review, where she's the editor and where she also oversees all book coverage. Prior to joining the New York Times, she was a contributor to Time Magazine and The Economist, and her work has appeared in a variety of publications, including The Atlantic and The Washington Post. The book's just out, and it's getting great reviews, including one in The Washington Post that calls this an engaging and often funny memoir. It's also a delightfully gushing love letter to books. Books is a medium that can connect us, transport us, and transform us. And at the risk of sounding too gushing myself, I'll say that I was really charmed by this book. And I feel very fortunate that, you know, how when you read a book, you wish you could talk to the author and ask her all of the questions that you've had while reading. And I'm actually going to get to do that in a few minutes. Uh, but first, uh, Pamela is going to read a couple of short excerpts. And then we're going to move over to our glamorous uh, conversation pit over here. And after that, we'll leave plenty of time for your questions as well. So please help me welcome Pamela Paul. So the title and the subtitle of this book um, are not fully self-explanatory, so I'm going to explain a little bit. Um, Bob is a journal that I've been keeping since I was 17 um, that lists every book that I've ever read since then. Um, and basically, this stems from the fact that I was a failed teenage diarist. I think like all kind of bookish little kids, especially girls, I, I kept a teenage diary. And um, I found that I turned to it during moments of teenage angst, you know, and it, when I looked back on it and read about it, it was really awful. It was fights with my parents. It was like Ingrid slept at Wendy's house and told me that she couldn't sleep over my house. It was just petty and obnoxious, and it wasn't even well written. And I found when I, when I, when I read back on these diaries um, that they basically contained all the things that I wanted to forget. Um, my book of books, however, contained the things that I wanted to remember, which was what I was reading when all of that was happening. Um, so Bob is sort of the one consistent and successful uh, uh, thing, I think, basically in my life. Um, and <coughs> in writing about it, I, I wanted to make sure, well, first of all, that it not be just about a list of books. I think it would be incredibly boring for someone else to read over my list of everything that I've read um, or to read about books that they haven't necessarily read. So this is a book that is rather about what happens between a book and a reader and how the books that I've read have influenced my life, have reflected my life, um, and uh, in many ways made my life um, and the way in which they do that for all of us. So I just want to read a couple of um, short excerpts, and I'm going to go out of order. Um, this first chapter that I'm going to read from is actually chapter 17. I named each chapter after a book. Um, and again, it's not because the chapter is really about that book, but because that book and something about it embodied what was going on in my life, and also something about books in general. So this chapter is called The Master and Margarita, after the Bulgakov novel, but it's about recommendations. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, you should read this book almost never simply means you should read this book. It is usually far more fraught. Telling someone what to read, even asking politely, can feel more like an entreaty or an implied judgment, or rather, there's something you should know than a straightforward proposal. If you read this book, then you love me. If you read this book, then you respect my opinions. If you read this book, you will understand what it is I need you to understand and can't explain to you myself. What might be about shared enthusiasm and appreciation can even weirdly become a kind of threat. If you read this book, then you'd know better. If you're smart, you'll read this. Or you have to be smart to read this, and you're a fool if you don't. Everyone else is reading this. Everyone else already has. There's good reason to take book recommendations personally even when they have more to do with the person doing the recommending than with the person on the receiving end of the suggestion. 
With my brother Roger, for example, book recommendations were imperatives that one needed to heed, and I wasn't sure I'd be his sister anymore if I didn't listen. Roger had trained me to follow his lead early on. When we were little, he lorded over our younger brother Brian and me, and whenever we violated one of his codes, his right finger would shoot high into the air in a brutal display of power. Suspension, he'd announce, drawing out the second syllable as if to savor our anguish. What's the suspension? What's the suspension? Brian and I would babble frantic. One week, no Atari, Roger would say with cool matter-of-factness, as if he'd just consulted the rule book. One week, no monster manual, no comic books, and later, oh bitterness, no Apple II+. Plus. Whatever we had done wrong, we had to be punished. Taking out the garbage for a few days might get us out of it, but that was scary. It was dark and there were raccoons. As he got older, Roger's laws transitioned from not letting me touch any of his books to foisting his books upon me. If I didn't follow his bidding, there would be trouble. One weekend, we had to go to a bat mitzvah in Colorado. Read this now, he said when we got there, handing me a copy of John Kennedy Tools, A Confederacy of Dunces. I don't want to speak to you until you're done. I read it. There was no need to threaten. I trusted him. When Roger read the red and the black his freshman year at Bard, I read the red and the black my sophomore year in high school, ever desperate to follow his lead and to please him. The effort would invariably be rewarded. Roger knew a good book, which I knew because I'd been secretly swiping his books for a long time. I read his junior novelization of Jaws when I wasn't allowed to see the movie. I extracted Go Ask Alice from under his bed when he wasn't home. Though I was only supposed to touch the monster manual and Dee Dee's and Demigods, which had already been sullied by overuse, I would read the forbidden Dungeon Master's Guide as well, and then replace it precisely in the place where I'd found it, as if nothing had happened. In the year 2000, to celebrate the new millennium, I made a deal with Roger, one in which I, for one, would dictate the book. If he read War and Peace, I would read War and Peace, and as a reward, I would fly the two of us to Russia for vacation. There we would, dis we would discuss the Bezukovs and the Bolinovskis, the Rostovs and the Kurigans, the Dubretskovs and Napoleon and Waterloo, and whether it was better than Anna Karenina, which he told me to read years earlier while hurtling by train from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Roger had long been my comrade in arms when it came to Russian literature. On a trip to Portland to visit our cousin Kirsten, he shoved into my hands Mikhail Bugakov's Soviet-era satire, The Master and Margarita. We'll talk when you're done, he said. And because I respected his taste, and possibly because I still feared his suspensions, I obeyed. After reading the love story of the imprisoned author, the master, and his devoted besotted Margarita, I passed it on to Kirsten, sealing the familial bond. In Russia, I would be able to repay Roger as we walked through the patriarch ponds and checked out the graffiti on Bugakov House, reimagining scenes in which the devil comes to Moscow. I was really doing Roger a favor. Everyone intends to read War and Peace eventually, and the Russia trip gave us an excuse. Roger would read his copy in San Francisco, and I would read mine in New York. I'd tried reading it several years, years earlier and had given up around page 100, lost. This time, I bought an edition with a crucial edition, a family tree. Aided by this handy patronymic roadmap, I could be swept into the narrative without forgetting who everyone was. The secret that Russian literature aficionados know, uh, sorry, somehow managed to keep from the rest of the world, daunted by names like Dostoevsky and Turgenev, is that Russian novels are essentially soap operas. Sure, there's the backdrop of the 19th century to contend with, but at heart, Russian novels are stories of unrequited lust, sorry, unrequited love, lusty affairs, and die-hard feuds. The lust is requited. Um, <laughs> even the long ones can feel too short. War and peace would be no problem. I'm on it, Roger told me every time I called to make sure he was keeping up his end of the bargain. Deep into the novel myself, I knew Roger would also love it. We both reveled in the darkly gleeful sla slapstick of Russian satire. I see myself in every lowly and ill-used clerk from Kolyav, Kolyav to Goliadkin, and my brother does too. I tore through War and Peace that month, and come March, we set off for the motherland. Everything was going according to plan. I couldn't wait to talk over our Tolstoy. I didn't read it, Roger confessed, once the plane reached cruising altitude, <laughs> but I meant to. Um, so I'm just going to read a, a small portion of another uh, chapter called Catch-22, which is basically about the fact that the more you read, the more you realize you haven't read. The more you want to read, the more you find that it's impossible. Um, and for me, too, it was about the acquisition of books. I was a very greedy child and also a relatively impoverished one when it came to books because I lived around the corner from our local library. And anytime I asked for a book, my mother's response was get it from the library. 
Um, I spent so much time in the library that I tried to get a job there. And every time I asked them for a job, I remember the first time I asked, I was 10. Um, I was flat out refused. I told them they didn't have to pay me, which I think scared them off even more. Um, so finally, I, I got a driver's license and I was able to get a job at the local branch of B. Dalton Booksellers. Now this was a job. I was the only high schooler who worked there, a monumental achievement and a source of fierce pride, even if you considered there wasn't much competition. All the other employees were actual grown-ups, some of whom saw the job as a calling, others who would just as easily have been working in the produce section at the a &P. Dan, the manager, was one of the former, a short, sweaty man in his mid-30s with sparse tendrils of black hair clinging hopefully to his pate, and a mind brimming with knowledge acquired the hard way. He greeted my enthusiasm and ignorance with tolerant dismissiveness. He had informed opinions. But I was determined to learn. I would know exactly what to read and what to, I would read next. My book of books would reflect this clear path forward. Here at B. Dalton, I could keep my pulse on the passions of the nation. I just had to pay attention. I quickly noticed, for example, that whenever a book broke out in a big way, someone from management ordered rising swirls of that title that spiraled up majestically from the floor. Only senior employees knew how to build and maintain these symmetrical assemblages. Regular sales clerks like me were not allowed to touch them. Massive cardboard displays known in the trade as dumps loomed over the aisles where they signaled the defining cultural events of the day. Over here, pillars of bonfires of the vanities. Over there, an imposing tower of Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, which everyone in the we're sophisticated suburbs just had to have. I would caress this slender volume longingly, imagining that if I owned it, my true place in the universe would make itself known. I envied the people who could just stroll in and purchase a few hardcovers off the important towers with a swipe of a credit card. Somewhere along the main aisle stood a commanding dump of Dianetics. These must be important, I mused, leafing through a copy during an idle moment. What do you think you're doing? Dan barked. Just curious, I said guardedly. What, guardedly, what is this? You don't want to know, he muttered with a quick wave of his hand. I put down the L. Ron Hubbard in a state of unquenched curiosity, too nervous to get caught going near it again. There were so many mysteries that eluded my beginner's grasp of the world of letters. What's this? I inquired, holding up one of Joseph Campbell's book on some anthology. Who was Joseph Campbell, and why was he so important? What's this? I asked, pointing to a swirl of Clan of the Cave Bear with the mermaid from Splash inexplicably crawling across its cover. How did this book get to be a movie, and what did that mean? So many books indicated something significant, yet inscrutable. Authors seemed to have reputations I couldn't quite dis deconstruct. Stuart Woods dominated an entire shelf, a monolith of contemporary letters, and Rule, Master of Criminal Justice. And then the threat of crime itself came to be Dalton. In 1989, when Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran issued a fatwa against Salman Rushdie for his novel, The Satanic Verses, my colleagues and I were swept up into what felt like a mission of global import. The only time I'd given thought to Iran prior to this was during the hostage crisis, when someone graffitied, fuck the Ayatollah, on a building near Main Street School, where it remained for the rest of my grade school education. Every time I looked at it, I thought, the world is full of mysterious danger. But this current danger was exciting. I became nearly delirious in my desire to sell the satanic verses, spellbound by photographs of Rushdie's daunting eyebrows and pungent gaze. The tapping of cash register buttons was swiftly upgraded into a campaign to save literature from the forces of darkness. I blazed with excitement. Each day, my coworkers and I reported for duty to get the latest instructions direct from corporate headquarters. Copies of Rushdie's book were to be kept near the cash registers. No, behind the cash registers. No, now in the back of the store, the stock room, where only management could tread. Employees who did not feel safe selling the book were allowed to be taken off the schedule, no repercussions. People were bombing bookstores. Suburban customers who couldn't for their lives tell the difference between Iran and Iraq, I counted myself among them, flocked in droves to our store, whether out of curiosity, for political purposes, or simply to feel part of something. They skulked up to the, skulked up to the cash register saying, in the hushed tones of a John le Carré character, they wanted to buy the book. If somebody asks whether we stock it or not, think carefully before you reply, we were told. Answer on a case-by-case -case basis. What's the book about, I asked Dan. Nobody knows, he replied. <laughs> That's it. Well, thank you. Those are great passages. Um, 
There's one book in here that you say changed the trajectory of your life. You might be hawking Captain Crunch cereal instead of working at the New York Times. Can you yes. talk about that a um, bit? <clears throat> So uh, when I was a senior in college, um, I thought that I would get a job in publishing um, or uh, writing or advertising. Um, my mother was an advertising copywriter, so uh, writing was a little bit in the family. Um, I had sort of been in awe of her growing up because she would she could come up with like 20 taglines for Chiquita Banana. It was like, it's Banana's Appeal, and like 20 other variations of that. Um, and so I thought, well, that sounded a little bit fun. So I was, I was interviewing for jobs along these lines, and I was in the middle of an interview with Quaker Oats. <laughs> and they asked me why did I want to work at Quaker Oats? And I started to answer. And it was one of those situations where you, you sort of have an out-of-body experience and you see yourself like from a bird's eye view. And I remember what I was saying to him it was like, I really like Crunch Berries, uh, Captain Crunch, but only when there are Crunch Berries. Like I don't really like it when they don't have the this, this sort of tart crunch berries. And I just suddenly was like, what am I talking about? Um, <laughs> what am I talking about? Like, is this why I went to college? Um, is this what all of the, you know, the grades and the tests and the studying and the reading was for? Is this what I'm meant to do with my life? And so I, I stopped midway through and I said to the interviewer, um, who actually pushed me on the answer and said, like, we all like the crunch berries, but <laughs> really, why do you want to work at Quaker Oats? And I said, you know what, I actually don't want to work at Quaker Oats, and I walked out. And um, I had been looking at this book um, that I found in the College Hill bookstore on Thayer Street in Providence, Rhode Island, called A Journey of One's Own by Thalia Zapatos. And the subtitle was Uncommon Thoughts for the Independent Woman Traveler. And Thalia Zapatos, um, the book had come out the year before, and she was, uh, photographed in the book, you know, on a camel and, and had these incredible stories about, you know, uh, swimming down the Ganges. Like, she had, she had done all this um, independent travel um, in far-flung places. And I read it, and I was like, well, that's something I would never do, because I was one of those people who, you know, had done my semester abroad in Paris. Um, and I'd never been to Asia. And I, I suddenly thought, but what if I did do that? What if I could do that? And I thought, well, I'd probably hate it. And then I thought, maybe I should do it because I think I would hate it. Maybe I've only been exposed to things that I'm really comfortable with. And maybe the reason I'm coming out of college wanting to do what I wanted to do when I went into college is because I've only looked at choices A through D. And maybe I don't know what E through Z are. So um, after reading this book, I decided I would go somewhere where every single aspect of my day would be challenged, um, that I, I wouldn't be able to get up and make coffee and read the New York Times, that every single moment would be um, something that, I, that forced me out of my comfort zone. And um, so I, I picked a bunch of countries. Um, the, the qualifications were they had to be countries that I had zero interest in. Um, they had to be countries where I knew no one, where I had no job, where I didn't speak the language, where I was a minority, where I couldn't live in an international city, having basically grown up in New York. Um, a number of other qualifications, and I narrowed it down, and ultimately I decided to move to a town in northern Thailand, and so I bought a one-way ticket, and I went. And it was one of those things where about 5% of me made this decision and dragged the other 95% along, so I don't feel like I get entire credit to it, but certainly a lot of the credit was due to Thalia Zapatos, because she had these passages in her book that said, you know, we're always looking for an excuse not to travel, not to make that leap, um, you know, we have the mortgage, we have a boyfriend or a husband or kids or a dog, and I thought, I have none of those things. I don't even have a job. Uh, so, so I went. And along the way, you uh, picked up a Spalding Gray book. Can you talk about that and how that led you to become his stalker, as yeah. you put it? <laughs> I, was, I was Spalding Gray's stalker. Um, I, um, I went to Cambodia for a couple of weeks, and I brought along um, Spalding Gray's book, Swimming to Cambodia. It was the first book that I'd read of his. And it was one of those experiences, and I write about this in a chapter about narrators and about the way that narrators get into your head and their voices kind of occupy your own mind. And I think that's especially true with travel books where it's not just about where they're traveling, but it's also about a companion. It's who you're traveling with is the author of the travel book. And as I was traveling in Cambodia with Spalding Gray, I just thought, 
I, I am Spalding Gray. Like Spalding Gray is me. It didn't matter that we had nothing in common. Um, you know, he is this waspish, uh, waspish uh, character, not waspish, but uh, New England wasp uh, who grew up. Uh, he had a, a very difficult childhood. His mother was suicidal. Um, he grappled with depression. Ultimately, obviously, he committed suicide a few years ago. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, I felt like we were the same person. And I, I, I think that was my first real literary crush. I had no romantic interest in Spalding Gray. I just, I just wanted him to know that, that like we were the same and for us to have <laughs> like, long lunches together discussing the, these things. So um, when I got back to New York, I continued to read everything that he read. And, and then I went to every performance that he gave. And I used to work, I was working at that time at Scholastic in Soho, and I would walk to work every day, and he was very much a figure in Soho, and I would walk different ways each time. I didn't know what street he lived on, but I, I, I altered my route so as to bump into him, and I would plot, you know, what I was going to say. It'd be like, you know, that wouldn't sound stalkerish, but would somehow engage him and convince him that we were meant to be friends. And I, you know, would run through these lines in my head, like, hey, Spalding, like, listen, um, I know this sounds odd, but, Anyway, ultimately, I did actually, uh, I did meet him, and he, I, I must have garbled out some kind of confession because he signed his book um, to Pamela Paul, my stalker, um, <laughs> Spalding Gray, so. Uh, one thing I loved learning about your reading habits, you, you read all, you're like a book omnivore, you read high, you read low, you love, you love children's literature, and you're having an interesting conversation in your book group about why people read. Do you want to? Yeah, it's what, funny what was your this, answer? Um, this is late in the book. Uh, I, I have this great book a club called Kidlet. Um, it's it's actually a, it's become a very popular book club, um, and it has three branches. And I'm I'm in the first branch, which I was very insistent on being on. Um, it's a, a bunch of people in it. Most of them are authors and agents and publishers, and and we read kids books. Um, I had always resisted joining a book club because I don't like having my reading dictated to me. And I didn't want to. I don't want to read what I don't want to read. Um, but with kids' books, I thought, well, the investment is relatively low because they're short and easy to read, so I can join that. And also, I love children's literature. And um, this particular group is, you know, not all of us have kids, um, and uh, it's not because. I, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty sophisticated group. Uh, but we were having a heated debate over, I think, a YA novel. And um, in the middle of the conversation, one of the members who is a child psychologist stopped and she said, well, I mean, why do you read? Your, your, your reaction to this book depends on why you read it. Like, why do you read? And it was such a basic question. And what was shocking is, um, you know, the publisher of HarperCollins is in this group, you know, high-powered literary agents. No one knew the answer off the top of their head. Like, none of us had actually thought about that very fundamental question so we all kind of paused and thought about it and we went around and everyone gave different answers you know um, and some of the answers were um, more nuanced you know some people said one woman said you know I used to read because I wanted to understand the world but now I, I just I, I want to escape the world um, or you know sometimes reading the desire to read would change after a death or a divorce or some um, major life event and my answer is that I read to be transported. Um, I read to have experiences that I think that I couldn't possibly otherwise have. You know, I'm not going to ever live on Pluto. I'm never going to be a 19th century coal miner in France. Um, I'm not going to have been, you know, the editor of the Washington Post uh, during Watergate. Um, and so I read to have experiences that I would never otherwise be able to have. But, but the answer is different for different people. And my own personal interjection, I love that you loved Sweet Valley High. I remember I used to take my daughter to the library and we'd kind of sneak them out because I worried. <laughs> but uh, do, you, do you let your kids read whatever they want within reason? I do. Um, you know, the thing about Sweet Valley High that was particularly hor horrifying to me or shameful was that um, there wasn't a lot of YA when I was uh, growing up. You know, young adults sort of hadn't been really invented as a genre. And so they existed in the local library in this sort of purgatorial mezzanine where you were, they were on like a spinning rack exposed to everyone. So like if you went up to like the rack, everyone would see you like looking at Sweet Dreams Romances or Sweet Valley High. And you just felt like completely exposed. Like I felt like I was buying tampons. Um, and uh, you know, I would, I would check them out and I would just, I would like put them in 
between like Jane Eyre, you know, and like a biography of Clara Barton. Stick it in the middle. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, I, but with my own kids, I, I, I do pretty much let them read what they want to read. I mean, my theory is that if you're going to encounter something difficult or something challenging, what better way to encounter it than a book? I'd much rather that they encounter it in a book than, you know, sort of on the whole wide internet um, or, you know, in a group of friends where you just don't know what kind of misinformation they might be exposed to. Um, generally speaking, uh, most books are the ones that they read are, have been edited um, and uh, I think in generally carefully thought out before they were published. So they tend to put things into context. And I, and I also, you know, I, I think that reading above all for kids should be seen as a pleasure and a privilege. And so allowing kids to choose their own books brings out both of those things, mm -hmm. you know, rather than it, it be, being thought of, thought of as, a, as an obligation or as something um, difficult, it's something that, you know, if you can read this, then you then you get to know. You also you wrote an op-ed recently about, uh, and you also touch on it in the book about reading outside your own bubble and outside your comfort zone. Can you talk about that a little, and also about any reaction that you? Add to that. I wrote an essay about the joy of hate reading, and I've heard from everyone who hates the fact that I hate um, Ayn Rand and I hate Flashman. They've all emailed me, and I've had correspondence <laughs> with them, um, or they've tweeted bitterly at me, and I, I apparently don't understand um, Flashman. But um, uh, yeah, I, I read Ayn Rand again in a state of naivete. I didn't know what objectivism was, I didn't know what libertarianism was. Um, it was assigned as, it actually wasn't assigned, it was on a suggested extra reading list for a class that I took in 20th century architecture in college and being the kind of dork that I am, I was like, I'm gonna read that entire suggested reading list too. Um, and so I brought it along with me on vacation to Paris where I was staying with a family I'd lived, in, lived with um, as a student abroad and the father was an architect and I was like, oh, look at what I've brought. And he said, you know, how of course, he was a socialist and a, you know, a soixante retard, and he just he said, "How could you bring that piece of shit into my house?" <laughs> um, but uh, I read it, and 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 I, I said, you know, but it's about building things. Um, I quickly realized that was not what it was about. But I, I really very determinedly read that book until the last bitter, you know, sentence. And I actually, it's just something I very rarely do. I threw that book out where it, it wouldn't hurt anyone ever again. Um, <laughs> And do you find it hard to maintain your love of reading with your job where you're just inundated? No, because I cheat a little bit. I mean, I had the great fortune of moving from being the children's books editor, where the obligation was like 32 pages long and therefore, you know, not, um, didn't take me away from my own pleasure reading, to having like a team of very talented, very hardworking editors who read all of the books for me. Um, so I, I and and I, I wish I could say that that was entirely strategic. I think it was just great fortune um, because I'm very selfish about what I read. I really like to read what I want to read. Um, occasionally, I do have to read for work, um, and uh, and I bitterly resent that um, because I, I for me reading is my great pleasure. And um, what what I what gets lost are um, movies and TV, which I, I never ever watch. So that ultimately, at the end of the day. I, I don't do my book, my work reading. I do my pleasure reading when I'm home. And tell us how this memoir came to be. And also, was it easy for you to write? You have such a sort of natural, easy tone in this. And I wonder how hard it was to achieve that. Um, no, it was a really hard book to write um, because my previous books had been um, journalistic investigations where I was reporting. I had an argument uh, that was based in the reporting and the object of the book was to persuade people mounting evidence and hopefully um, a, uh, a worthwhile um, argument uh, to finish the book and agree with me. Um, and there's really nothing to agree with in this book. Um, this book is not reported. I didn't have to interview anyone. Um, I had to uh, write about myself and that's something that I generally avoid doing. Um, I, I'm in awe of memoirs, who, uh, you know, memoirists who can like write all about their mother and sort of not worry about what she's going to think. Um, in fact, I was telling someone about this. I was in a conversation with another author and another book editor, and we were talking about um, 
clubbing in the 80s in New York. And uh, and when the author said, oh, I can't wait to read your book and read all about that. And I was like, are you kidding? I didn't put any of that in there. And uh, and <laughs> the editor said, why not? And I said, well, because my, my mother is alive. And, and, and they said, oh, that's so sweet that you're protecting your mother. And I said, I, I'm not protecting my mother. I'm protecting myself. <laughs> um, but most of the stuff did get in, get end up in there. The way that I wrote it was I figured I would write it all as if no one were watching. Um, and then at the end, I'd go back and I'd reread it and very carefully take everything out that you know was exposed me too much. And and then I just I never got around to doing that. So <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> um, and can I ask you a few questions about the Times? Sure. About, yes. uh, you mentioned in there that you review one percent of all the books that's pu that are published each year. Is that uh, accurate? Um, no that more, is an yeah. accurate statistic insofar as I stole it from my predecessor. <laughs> um, it's probably actually less than that. Um, you know, the, the thousands of books come out every week. Yeah. We don't even look at self-published books or e-books only because we just don't have the bandwidth to do that. Um, we need to, you know, the, just the triage alone is extraordinary. We have a team of people who open up the mail, just open up the mail twice a day to get through all of the galleys that come to our office. Um, and then we have this multi-tiered step, you know, process by which we winnow it down, sort of mass triage. Um, when I was the children's books editor, um, and that's a solo operation, we're the only newspaper that, that actually the only news organization in the country that has its own full-time children's books editor, but you're basically, that's as many books, there are as many books for kids as there are for adults, so you're doing it all yourself. And I, um, I got there, and at that time there were two pages of children's book reviews a month in the book review, and I, I immediately said to my predecessor, Sam Tannenhaus, that's not enough, I can't get them all in, I need three pages, plus I'm gonna review one a week myself online only, you, I, you won't have to pay me, I'll just do that. And, um, and then that way I can cover more of the worthy, worthy books. And after about four or five months of this, I, I still felt like these, there were books slipping through the cracks and I couldn't cover them all. And I called my predecessor as children's books editor, Julie Just, and I said, you know, Julie, I can't do it. I can't get them all in. Like there, there's so many great books. There are award winners, there's things. I know this is gonna be a Newbery, you know, finalist, if not a medalist, and I can't get it in. And she said, Nobody expects you to get it all in. There's no way to get it all in. You just, you, um, and, and that was very soothing. Um, I, I got over that panic attack um, with that. Um, but what we're trying to do at the Times is we realize nobody has the time to read all of these books. Nobody has the time to even read all about these books. So what we are doing by not reviewing all of them is we are performing, we're curating for them and performing a service by saying, okay, I have all of these books. We are gonna go through all of them. We're still gonna review the entire landscape, even if we only look at a book for two seconds before deciding that we're not going to review it. And we are going to do that work for you so that you have a much better sense of which books matter. And you've also changed, the, you've consolidated the book coverage. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, so the word consolidation, as a skeptical media reader, <laughs> I read as reduction, but in this case, it's actually not a reduction. Um, we have unified our coverage at the times of, of books um, and at the same time expanded that coverage. So traditionally, and this is getting a little bit in the weeds, so hopefully some of you people are like New York Times. Does anyone here like read the New York Times regularly or books coverage? <laughs> okay, so it's some people the, are will the be right interested audience. in this. <laughs> yes. Um, so the New York Times book review is the oldest freestanding and the only freestanding newspaper book review in the country now. It dates back to 1896, and it dates to the time when newspapers had separate weekend and weekday operations in the same way that they had in the UK where you had the Times of London and then the Sunday Times. So we're like the, the vestigial organ of that weekend operation, the book review. At the same time, we have three full-time staff critics that operate out of the culture department, and that culture department was traditionally part of the newsroom. Finally, we have a full-time publishing reporter, again, the only newspaper um, in the country to have one at this time. Um, and that person operated centrally out of biz day. Um, and so you had three different departments at the newsroom covering books, in addition to 
the magazine, the food section. I mean, I, books touch upon every area of our news coverage, so you're going to find books referenced in one way or another and everywhere from the science section to you know the politics. Um, but in terms of, of dealing with books as, as a medium and an art form in and of themselves, there were those three sections. And what we did was we decided last year at the Times to consolidate them into one department. Um, and at the same time, rather than just at that point say, let's take books and smush three sections that were based on the print edition of the New York Times together and create a new department with those smushed together departments, let's stop and take a moment and think in a global era you know, when the New York Times was founded these departments, we were a metropolitan newspaper. In a global era, in a digital era, um, what is it, and in, in this competitive landscape where there is so little book review coverage, but there's a lot of other kind of books conversation, what is it that the New York Times should be doing with regard to books? What do our readers want? And how can we best address our current readers' needs and future readers' needs? Um, how can we cover books that, you know, what's going on in the book world in China, in Australia, in Canada, in Brazil? How can we help readers navigate the world of books beyond simple book reviewing? So when we consolidated those three departments, we also took a long time to talk to people in the business, talk to, I talked to other people around the newsroom, to do a lot of uh, audience research, and to really think hard about what the future of books coverage at the New York Times should be. And one of the reasons why we decided to expand this as we consolidated these three desks is because the New York we at the New York Times believe that books is one of those areas that our readers look to they look to us as a for a source of information and guidance and an, as an authority on books and that this is something that we consider to be a core part of our journalistic mission. And so for that reason, in addition to grouping these three desks together, we've hired you know five or six people so far and more to come and brought on new columnists so that we are answering questions that we think most of our readers want to know. And some of that wasn't necessarily addressed when we just had the book review and the three critics and the publishing reporter. Questions like, you know, wh what should I read? very basic, but you might not necessarily get that from just reading the, a, a week of the book review. Um, why does this book matter? Why am I hearing about this book, whether it's Thomas Piketty or Colson Whitehead? Why is everyone talking about this? Why is it resonating? Is this book any good? Should I actually read it? And those are the kinds of things that we're trying to do with our expanded coverage. Well, I have plenty more questions myself, but let me see if anybody else has anything to ask. Yeah, could you? Yeah, that would be great, thanks. Well, I live on a little island off the coast of South Carolina and have nobody to talk with books with. I grew up in Washington reading the New York Times and the Washington Post and I was a journalist for about 10 years and so I could just grab you and talk to you all night long. <laughs> um, but I will say that um, the Sunday book review section. The Sunday Times is my salvation. I drive into town on Sunday morning to the grocery store and pick it up and it is uh, sustains me throughout the week. But especially the book review section because um, that's who I talk to. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you need to know that there are some people out there that are desperately addicted and dependent, um, even remote regions like an island off the coast of South Carolina. And I want to say one other thing that I just think might be of interest to you. I have a daughter who's now almost 30, but she had Asperger's syndrome when we were growing up. And uh, she was very smart, but I worried a lot about her. But she was an incredibly prodigious reader who started in diapers. It was just amazing. But uh, she grew into this most gracious young woman, and she attributes it all to the Babysitter's Club. She said, I learned what to say and how to say it from the Babysitter's Club. And so I thought that was interesting about Sweet Valley High, that there, you never know what value is there. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Oh, sure. Do you mind coming? Uh, We've got a question here, and then we'll have you come to the mic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm very interested in Bob. You haven't talked much about Bob. Uh, just the mechanics of Bob, maintaining Bob. 
One of the things I'm interested in is how many books are on Bob, considering <laughs> how long you've, you've been doing it. Uh, yeah, and, that's the uh, one thing I'm not revealing. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> you know, I, I didn't actually enumerate what was in Bob um, until I was sort of well into the 300s. Um, I, I hadn't thought to do it. Um, and I think I had a boyfriend at the time who was like, oh, go write it in Bob. That's all you're doing it is to just, you know, keep a tally. And I thought, wow, I never thought to count them. And then, of course, that idea sort of poisoned me, and so I went back uh -huh. and I, I numbered them. But anyway, I'll address your other questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, I'm also interested in what we retain, how much we retain of what we read. Um, I find sometimes that I will, in my mind, I will think that was a book that really affected me, but I don't remember what happened in it. Um, do you find that sometimes you'll look back in Bob and you'll see a title and you realize that you really don't remember a thing about that book? Yes, um, <laughs> it happens all the time. I mean, I recount this this uh, really embarrassing um, episode in uh, in the book where um, my my first husband um, pinned me down like six months after I finished reading um, Somerset Mom's. Um, uh, now the title is The escape. Razor's Edge? No, no, no. Of no. um, Human Bondage. Okay. And he said, what was the name of the protagonist? And I was like, <laughs> his, his, the woman he loved was Mildred. You know, and I could not remember <laughs> that it, his name was Philip. Um, so what I found with my book of books, I, I do have actually a pretty terrible memory um, for what I read. Um, but what I found is that when I look back at this list and I see what was before it and what came after it, and I, every once in a while in Bob, I'll note the, the time and the place, um, especially when I was traveling abroad and living abroad uh, a lot in my 20s, that the place was more important. Um, and I can remember those moments. I can remember ha just having it in that trajectory. Um, it creates a kind of story and an Ed memoir in and of itself because I remember, oh yes, I picked up that book because after reading this book, I needed like a palate cleanser, or I, 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 I this there were, I'd read all this contemporary fiction, and I just really needed to go back to like Dickens, um, or and I and I remember. I mean, I think for many of us too, we remember we remember the experience of reading something, and we remember how it made us feel, and we remember the circumstances around it, even if we don't remember exactly what was in the book. We remember our reaction to it. So, um, you know, often when you go tra when you travel, for example, you remember, um, oh, right, on that trip to France, you know, I was reading this book. And, or when you see a book, you remember, oh, I remember I read that on the beach. Um, it's just, I think that um, because, in part, I think because reading a book, unlike watching a movie or watching a TV show, is an essentially active experience. It, it's an interactive um, sort of way of, appreciating art because you're adding to the story, you're filling in the blanks, you're involved in picturing what a fantasy world looks like or what a character looks like. And so because of that active engagement, I think that we remember sort of around that experience more even if we don't remember what was in the book itself. And, and Bob himself is nothing to look at. He's very frayed. I, I've oh, really? spilled coffee on him. Yeah, uh, he's not in good shape. He doesn't is travel there a anymore. Of it? I do. Uh, you yeah, know, I have a picture of it on, online, and I have, I have a, um, I have the first page of Bob is in the book, uh, which is highly embarrassing um, <laughs> because <laughs> it includes things like Faulkner, but it also includes like a memoir by the roadie from The Doors. Um, <laughs> that was what I was reading when I was 17. I, I had a Bob for a few years in, in high school, and I recently looked at it. The first thing on it was. John Jonathan Livingston Seagull. So <laughs> right. I know what you're talking about. Well, one of the local listings for your event uh, posed the meta question whether you were going to include your memoir in Bob since you are. Oh, God, <laughs> since I've read it like 20,000 times. Um, no, you know, what doesn't get in there either is picture books. And I regret that in a way because my tally would be so much higher uh, having three kids if I allowed picture books in there. But the, the, I. I, I, I I have to draw the line. <laughs> Did you, you had a question? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. I, I wanted to go back to your, when you started talking about your brother mm -hmm. and uh, your relationship with him. And when you were talking about how he was meeting out these different punishments, my, I was wondering like where your parents were in all of this and what your relationship <laughs> is like uh, now or what effect he's had on your career. And if Bob is sort of uh, 
you know, takes the place of answering to your brother? Um, well, you know, I, I, I thank him very much in the, um, in the acknowledgments. Um, I, where were my parents? So this was the 70s, and the, it was the era of benign neglect, and my mother worked, and uh, my parents divorced when I was little. So I, you know, starting from the age of eight, I basically, you know, took care of myself um, in a lot of ways. I think that, that um, the parenting philosophy um, back then was, you know, at my house at least, work it out amongst yourselves, which usually meant violence. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I had a lot of stepbrothers too. So I, I had seven step seven brothers altogether growing up. Um, so uh, there was a reason I was hiding in those books. I, 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 w I wouldn't get beat up in that way. But I have an excellent relationship with my brother Roger now. Um, and, uh, and he might even read this book. <laughs> And the other question that I had just came to me when the last person asked the question. What is your opinion of um, the experience of reading versus listening on Audible? I love audiobooks. I mean, I think that they're amazing. I wish I had the time uh, to read them. I uh, listen to them um, most of the time that I have in which I could possibly read an audiobook or listen to an audiobook is when, uh, it, right now, I used to listen to them more, um, but is with my kids. So uh, I'm sort of s subjected to three other opinions about what it should be. Luckily, there are some great audiobooks for kids. Um, to listen to E.B. White, for example, read Charlotte's Web is an amazing experience that I think in many ways um, exceeds the experience of, of reading it, or Roald Dahl reads some of his own books um, on audio. So I, I, I do include them in Bob. This has been controversial with some people in my life, but I, I include a little <laughs> audio notation next to it to note that I didn't actually physically read the book in question. And I, I, I had one book in my car recently. It was um, A. Scott Berg's Biography of Wilson, and I sort of tested the uh, my children a little bit by being like, I'm just going to put on a little bit of Wilson. Um, and uh, they didn't really take to that very well. <laughs> they were like, when is he going to be done with Princeton already? Um, so uh, my audiobook listening years are probably a little bit further in the future. Any other questions? I waited until there, <coughs> there wasn't a line, because I'm not sure this is that. Uh, worthwhile a question, but I would like to uh, get your answer. Um, it's really a kind of a mixture of uh, questions, I guess. Partly, I was intrigued by the uh, reading high and reading low. And apparently, Bob, that is your, your uh, reading experience reflects, you know, includes both uh, in the hundreds or whatever that are in Bob. Um, is, it, is it pretty clear when you read back through Bob um, uh, from the am amount of uh, material and so forth, whether you were reading high or whether you were reading low, are you able to um, develop a lot of ideas when you do read low? Um, presumably when you read high, there's, there's a l at least a lot to, uh, to digest and yeah. uh, that that might lead to uh, more of, a, uh, of an entry on your part rather than just tossing off uh, a few comments about reading, reading low. Um, if, so, if you'd say something about how low do you read and how <laughs> high do you read? Um, well, so for me, reading is about um, an emotional and intellectual need that's often very in the moment. Um, it's a sort of a gut level um, decision. So uh, as I get to the end of a book, I usually develop a short list of books that I think might go next. Um, and. I will change that short list as I go along because I might come across another book or think of something else, but I don't ultimately decide what I'm going to read next until that actual moment when I finish the book that I'm reading um, because it, it's, it's really about what I want to read what, or what I feel like I need at that moment. So the high and the low isn't anything calculated. Um, it's that, you know, sometimes you want to read um, a fantasy novel. Um, or I, I, for me, like um, sort of lightweight escape reading for me is often thrillers or spy novels. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're stupid books. And it doesn't mean that they're any less worthwhile than a history or a biography or literary fiction. Um, but it just might be what I need at that moment. Right. Um, and um, 
I I do read high and low. I, my, my low reading is often if something is a major bestseller, um, pr both professionally and also as a kind of just curiosity about the world. I want to know why, like what was it about that book that engaged so many people? Um, so that means I usually read those books late because I wait to see like how big a phenomenon. So a book like Girl on the Train, I didn't read until I think a year after it came out because it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to read. But then I just, after a while, became curious because it was such a publishing success story. Right. I wanted to know, well, what was it about that particular book? Um, so that often means that I'm reading big sort of commercial bestsellers right. much later after the fact. Um, and reading high, again, I, I don't, I'm not, I never planned to write this book. I never planned to show anyone my Bob, so I've never kept it for anyone but me. Um, so it wasn't, a, it's not an, uh, you know, thinking like, well, I gotta make Bob look a little bit <laughs> better um, after reading all of these, you know, thrillers. Um, it's just what I, what I wanted to know at, the, right. at that time. And um, so reading high for me is often, um, you know, reading is often for me a way to absorb information. I mean, I'm, right. I guess other people, watch PBS, but uh, I, I don't uh, have TV, so I read. Right. Well, I'll finish with a comment that your book sounds like the perfect book for someone like me who spends a significant amount of time here in the bookstore, <laughs> has done so for other bookstores. And, um, so you're just confronted with such a, uh, uh, you know, such a long list of choices that yeah, Trying I feel like this is the appropriate this, venue. This yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> These are your people. <laughs> questions over here. I had, I had two questions. The first was about Thailand. Um, you're starting to speak about it and then pulled back, and I wondered if you'll ever write about that experience um, or if you would ever do something like that in a memoir. So I wrote a memoir about living in Thailand. I wrote it when I was 24. Okay. I am very grateful that no one ever published it. <laughs> um, it was totally a, a, a real embarrassment. And I know that because my husband, who's much more technologically adept than me, like adapted those like old word processor files to a computer. And like every time it went from like hard disk to floppy disk to like, I don't know what else, it's now like on the cloud. Okay. And I thought <laughs> when I signed this book deal, one of the reasons I was able to recall some of the things so well is because I had written about 70,000 words of this mm -hmm. book on Thailand. And I went back and I was like, this is going to be easy peasy because I got all of this already done. <laughs> and, uh, and I read it and God, was it bad. It was re okay. it's really <laughs> terrible. The writing was awful. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and you think that Thomas Mann wrote Budenbrooks when he was 25. I am no <laughs> Thomas Mann because what I wrote at that age mm -hmm. was really pretty dreadful. Um, but I did have a lot of detail in there. And, um, and again, in my, my attempt to like not have a memoir somehow be so personal, I kept trying to include a lot about Thailand. And I insisted for mm -hmm. a long time to my editors that there had to be three full chapters on Thailand that I needed. Like I had a whole section on my motorcycle riding and a whole thing on, you know, the sex trade in Thailand. And, you know, I did the same thing with China. I had a lot to say about the, you know, Uyghur autonomous region. And uh, my editors were like, this is not a travel book. So <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of that ended mm -hmm. up on the cutting room floor. OK. All right. And then uh, my other question is, a lot of the books that are award winners or commercial bestsellers are covered a lot in the papers. Who is one of your favorite contemporary writers, maybe, who might not be as covered? Someone we could look at who we might not find in the Times and the Sunday or in the Post? Or well. I mean, of contemporary writers, you know, they do tend to, well, first of all, they tend to be in the New York Times because I'm the editor. So I t mm -hmm. if I like them and I think they're important, they tend to end up in there. And, and, mm -hmm. and um, so my undiscovered writers are more people, you know, um, who mm -hmm. uh, wrote a long time ago. Um, Maybe underrated would be the right word. I feel like I need my Bob. I can't, <laughs> it's true, okay. I have to consult. <laughs> um, him. I mean, what I've tried to do with our coverage is, I mean, first of all, we review books before they sell. Mm -hmm. So we don't know that they're going to become bestsellers. Mm -hmm. um, that, the, you know, the, the bestseller list is an independent, uh, you know, uh, news and survey um, group that uh, is tracking actual sales. So we don't, we're not able to anticipate that. Um, what I think makes the job interesting for most of us as editors is not only to weigh in on the big books, but also to discover new voices mm -hmm. and herald people who um, might not have otherwise gotten the attention. Mm -hmm. And I think that you can especially see that, I hope, 
during my tenure on our 10 best lists, which is where I w do the most weighing in in collaboration with the editors on our on our staff. Um, so some of the writers, you know, we I think now two years ago uh, named a book called by um, Magda Sabo, who is n not alive actually, but her book The Door, um, which is a Hungarian novel, had been translated uh, into English for the first time a mm -hmm. couple of years ago, and that was a book that we named as one of our ten best. Mm -hmm. So we're not just kind of choosing the the obvious, but we're really taking to heart that these are not the biggest books, they're not maybe the mm -hmm. most important books, but we these are the books that we think are of the greatest, the highest quality in the books that we think will endure. Great. All right. Thank one, you. One mm -hmm. thing I've noticed you've begun doing is sometimes going back and reviewing or bringing to people's attention books that are older that are even out of print. Along. Yeah, so we've a couple of things that we've started to do. One of our critics, Dwight Garner, has started a column called American Beauties where um, every other week he is writing about a forgotten or underappreciated work um, of American literature specifically. Um, and, and overall for the book's desk, we, part of our um, expanded vision for what the New York Times should be doing with books is not just to write about the latest books. I mean, we're a news organization, so we're, we're going to do that. Um, but we know that people read both new and old books. I certainly do. Um, and um, and so we want to write about why some older books might be especially worth reading right now, and why um, the relevance and and, and you know, <laughs> for better or for worse, our current political moment has actually um, bolstered that by um, uh, leading people to reach back to some of the great dystopian classics, for example, or to Hannah Arendt, um, and to uh, read those kinds of books that might not be new, but um, might um, illuminate our current moment in new ways. All right, we have time for two last questions. Uh, I'm wondering, since you read so much when you were a child, did you ever talk about the books that you read with other people? Did it drive you to want to discuss them, or did it make you more introverted so that you withdrew into your books? And whatever that was, how did it affect how you operated uh, as you grew up? Um, so no, I had no one to talk to my books about. First of all, I was way too embarrassed to talk about, you know, Judy Bloom or anything like that. And I was even embarrassed, you know, I had an obsession with biographies at the time, which I just thought, you know, marked me as a as a as a as a total loser. I my brother Roger and I actually would compare. Like for him, it was joining the chess club, which he felt, you know, sealed his social fate forever. For me, it was like reading, you know, biographies for fun. Um, and there wasn't, you know, um, there weren't like fan clubs for uh, children's book authors at that time. There wasn't an online community or anything. So I, I pretty much considered it a mark of shame to be so interested in books. It wasn't an era, at least where I was growing up, um, where you know people kind of took out the bookish child and was like, she's such a reader. You know, you were meant to be, you know, running around doing sporty activities or playing musical instruments or ice skating. And I didn't have any of those talents or skills. So I felt like my reading was something that I, I had to keep to myself. So I would say that now that being in this particular job with the particular group of people I'm surrounded by, I feel like it's like that scene at the end of that old movie, Freaks, you know, where they're like, one of us, one of us. Like, I feel like I have found my people, and, uh, <laughs> and they will always talk to me about books. <laughs> so thank you. It all ended well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, something that I would uh, often think about, I read a lot of criticism as well as just reading books. And uh, with the overwhelming number of books available, do you feel like over time, uh, critics, the Times specifically, have changed from you know say taste makers to something else? You know, I'm o I'm always fascinated by the fact that you look at year end lists and there's so many books that are on you know the same books are on the same list. You know, is that parallel thinking? Is that um, you know, are there more you know? With more books, are there more books that are being overlooked um, or not necessarily, I guess is what I'm Well, I mean, there are always books that are overlooked. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the year when all the best, 10 best 
lists come out. The reason why there is certain, to a certain degree, consensus is because we're all, you know, we're all book critics reading the same books, and certain books really do just rise to the top. I mean, my hope is that, and I, I think that at least um, in the five years that I've been doing this particular job at the Times, that um, our list has been a little bit different from other people's lists, um, and we're really trying to. Um, be especially global in our um, ap appreciation of, of books. Um, but, you know, I, I, have I answered that question? Uh, I think so. I mean, I, I guess what I, yeah, I guess I'm just curious, um, again, with so many books, and you say that the ones that rise to the top is because you are lovers of books, but you also say that, you know, there's so many books that you're, you know, touching 1%. So is it just coincidence that all the critics are touching roughly the same 1%? I'm not saying well, that as a criticism. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it also depends And some, you know, one of the things we talk about when we come up with our 10 best books of the year is what does it mean to be a best book? Um, because it's different from the most important books. There are sometimes books that we think have a really important message. Um, the research is amazing. The argument is powerful and cogently, you know, written. Um, but the book itself might not be great, um, or it might be so of the moment that it's not something that's going to endure. Um, and so, you know, it's one of the. It's, this is especially true with nonfiction that it's very tempting to be like, well, this was the big book. Um, but you know, Thomas Piketty, for example, that was a very important book. It w wasn't one of our ten best. Like ultimately, when you looked at it as a whole, the reading experience, the writing, etc. Like it, what we're trying to do is is consider every aspect of that book. Um, and so for us, the the best has to do overwhelmingly with a quality that we think is going to last. Um, and that means that um, something might be considered a small book, um, but so well done. You know, there was a book, for example, on our 10 best last year that I felt very strongly about, um, which was Ian McGuire's The North Water. And I don't think it was on anyone else's 10 best. It was a long listed for the Booker, but I don't think it was even shortlisted. Um, but it was a um, it was a, a, an adventure story, um, a, 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 like a old fashioned whaling story, really gory, really well done, and just propulsive in its plot. And and the writing was excellent. The characters. Um, and you could say, well, that's just kind of literary genre fiction, like that. But it was, for what it was, it was just perfectly executed. Um, and I felt really strongly that the list, you know, it should also be books that you would actually want to pick up and read and enjoy that experience. Um, so I do think that each news organization and every editor and every critic brings to the end of the year list a little bit of their own agenda and thinking around it that, that differs. So. I don't, you know, the lists aren't entirely duplicative. Um, I'm sure BuzzFeed's list is different from the New Yorker's list is different from ours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We have books behind the register and Pamela's gonna be signing right here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.